I'm Dr. Scott Lyons, and you're watching or listening to The Gently Used Human. Polly what? In a world where traditional relationship structures are being challenged and redefined, the concept of polyamory has merged as a topic of both curiosity and controversy. Today, we'll delve into the intricacies of this multifaceted approach to love and intimacy with Jessica Fern, and author of Polysecure, Attachment, Trauma, and Non-Monogamy. Jessica's expertise lies in guiding individuals, couples, and those in multiple partner relationships to transcend the limitations of reactive patterns, cultural conditions, insecure attachment styles, and past traumas. Through her work, she invites us to explore new possibilities in life and love, challenging the conventional norms that have long governed our understanding of relationships. In this episode, we'll unpack the definition of polyamory and its place within the broader umbrella of consensual non-monogamy. We'll confront the misconceptions and taboos surrounding the lifestyle, such as the belief that it's rooted in promiscuity or an inability to commit. We'll delve into the concept of erotic blueprints, a framework for understanding our unique desires and needs within the realm of intimacy. Jessica will guide us through the different styles of erotic blueprints from energetic to kinky and how understanding our blueprint can enhance our connections and sexual satisfaction. Who doesn't want that? Join us as we embark on the thought-provoking journey, challenging societal norms and embracing the diversity of human connection. Whether you're curious about polyamory or seeking to deepen your understanding of intimacy or simply open to exploring new perspectives, this episode promises to be an enlightening and transformative experience. Let's get this party started. Jessica, welcome to the Gently Used Human Podcast. I'm so excited to have you, my friend. It's where have you been since we started? Why are we just doing this now? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> now <question>. I <laughs> now I've heard from some semi viable sources that you are the queen of polyamory. Is that true? <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't call myself the queen of polyamory. <laughs> but clearly um my books The have, Queen Educator of I, Polyamory. My books have been influential. Yeah, and have been a Oh my god, you're so humble. You're so sweet. <laughs> You're like, I think like people no longer go to the ethical slut as the Bible of polyamory. They go to your books. That's a big deal. It's amazing. It's such a like amazing surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. You know, I remember reading Ethical Slut when I was in high school. Wow. Um, and I gave it to my mom when she got divorced. <laughs> I just remember that right now. And I and I remember saying something to her about like you know, it's a really interesting book. Mm. Just ignore the bad grammar. Oh, yeah. Like it needed an editor. <laughs> <laughs> it needed like a gr like a very hardcore yeah. grammar editor bad. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but maybe we can back up and just say to our audience, like, you know, you've written th these great books, Poly Secure, Poly Wise. Maybe we can start with what is, what, a, what is Poly? What's, and why is it hot to trot? Great. Yeah. <laughs> Those are two questions, actually. Those are two yeah. questions. I, I rumbled them into I one. I like it. For, so, yeah. yeah. Polyamory is basically when there's more than one lover, like fall in love type of relationships. It could be sexual or romantic, and everyone is consenting and knows. So it's under the umbrella of consensual non-monogamy or ethical non-monogamy, which has many styles, and polyamory is one of them. Oh, okay. So this is kind of new info uh -huh. for some of us, not for me, of course. Right. But <laughs> no. you're like, I'm the what? king of poly. <laughs> uh, I wish. I just can't get into it, yeah. which is what we'll get to talk about. Talk I mean, about we've that. had this conversation yeah. a lot. I'm like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I be polyamorous? Which now it's like basically your second book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> so let's let's go to the bigger umbrella. What are you, what's what's ethical non monogamy and why is polyamory just like a subsection? Yeah. So ethical or consensual non monogamy is that there's more than one sexual or romantic partner in some form, and everyone knows yeah. about it. It's not cheating. Okay. Basically. Okay. So you can have couples that have like an open marriage where maybe they have mm -hmm. some sex on the side, or maybe they play with people together. Uh, swingers yeah. usually play with people together. Okay. Um, right. And then there's solo polyamory and different types of 
hierarchical and non-hierarchical, all that kind of stuff. And so polyamory is really, I'm looking to fall in love with more than one person and have like an in love partnership or relationship with more than one person, which is different than other styles that might be more sexually or kink based or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Does your, does your practice and just for the audience, your books go into like the whole ethical non-monogamy umbrella or does it specify or go much more into detail about in your work? on? Yeah. Polyamory? Well, what's interesting is that people are rarely one full style. Oh. So they might be, you know, polyamorous in one relationship. And then in this other relationship, yeah. it's more of something else, right? So we can yeah. even have different styles with our partners. But in my first book, Polysecure, I do have a nice chart that sort of maps yeah. all these styles out. But then I move into talking more about attachment-based polyamorous relationships and how do you have more than one attachment partner is the whole thing mm. in of itself. And then poly-wise, of course, poly's in the you know title, so it's implying more of that polyamorous style. But people, again, in all the different styles can benefit from from the book and just being non-monogamous at large. Yeah. Mm. What, uh, you know, it's funny. Like I, I realized just a moment ago, I was like, Oh, the, the language we're using now, which is like, you know, consensual non-monogamy, mm -hmm. uh, polyamory, like it's really shifted away from that older language of like an ethical slut. Yeah. And I kind of miss slut. <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't know it until this moment that I've been missing slut for a while. Yeah, you want it to be like ethical <laughs> sluthood. <laughs> I, I yeah, poly a little bit. Yeah, it's poly sluthood. Like I don't know. Do you ever do? You, have you ever or do you ever use the language of slut? I think with my clients, if they use it, I'm happy. Like I'll just join okay. whatever language they like. You know, I don't necessarily course, like yeah. use it for myself, right? Okay. But yeah, I think that's one of the things with ethical slut was that word. It almost came like too soon. Like it was so ahead mm. of its time with that word that like people weren't yeah. ready to embrace that yet. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. still had, I mean, I grew up with that with, yeah. as a big negative connotation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's more of a sexual term, right? Yeah. About being sexually promiscuous instead of having yeah. like multiple loves sounds so much, you know, <laughs> sounds more <laughs> acceptable, but it, that's not what I'm promoting. <laughs> <laughs> What what do you think's made it so like I mean I'm gonna use this term again like I love this term so I'm just gonna use it like hot to try hot like, to try yeah like I know like I know TV producers that are looking for a, like psychologists to make TV shows about polyamory like they're they're bored with they're bored with anything else or like what's going on I know they've reached out to me too they're like one I'm glad they yeah. did yeah <laughs> I was like I'm not your person go to Jessica. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> It's so fascinating to me, too, because shows like dating shows like The Bachelor, yeah. Love is Blind, you know, those that yeah. genre of reality TV, they're all polyamorous until the end. Like, it's all about creating multiple oh, connections. You're supposed to be forming multiple intimacies and they all have feelings and love triangles. But then at the end, you pick one, right? Mm. So there's that new show, Couple to Threpple. I don't know if you've yeah. seen this, right? I, I've heard about you've it. You've heard about it, yeah. And and there's yeah. pros and cons to it, but just the fact yeah. that it's like actually promoting itself as a non-monogamous show, that is the point, mm. is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I think there's all these shows that have been non-monogamous anyway, <laughs> and then yeah. they're like, Let's <laughs> that's that funny. Official. I never thought about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think if we pan back, there's just, you know, all of these structures – that have been in play mm. around sexual orientation, gender, identity, those have already been deconstructed or are being deconstructed mm. and addressed over the last few decades. Yeah. And so monogamy is finally the next in line. Mm. So I think it's sort of in this larger wave of social movement of seeing like things are in a binary or one way. There's multiple ways mm -hmm. to be a person and do relationships. This is like a very, like a, a sexual liberation on another level. It sounds like, yeah. Of, wow. I mean, and it's not like polyamory or you know, like being in multiple relationships is something <clears throat> new. 
No. Like, I'm assuming it's been around for a while. <laughs> I mean, what the historians say is that it has been around yeah. since we have been humans, right? Yeah. I even read this thing. I don't know how valid it is. It seemed valid. It was in a journal that they think that a lot, like, historically humans, a lot of, there weren't, yeah. like, full siblings from the same parents. Like, everyone was, like, half siblings because there was, like, multiple mm. mating, right? Yeah, you yeah, mate yeah. with one person and then you move on to have babies with a different person. I mean, that sounds about right. Right. It makes sense. <laughs> like, it, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I have some friends who've done the same. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's become much more acceptable. It's become more popular. And what are what are still some of the taboos or misconceptions about polyamory or ethical non-monogamy? Yeah. So, some of the taboos are that it's sluthood, right? That it is people who can't commit, maybe they have an attachment Mm. issue, maybe they have a sex Mm. addiction. So that's really pathologizing it. Or that it's all about sex. And Mm. for some people, that's great. It might be about sexual diversity. But for a lot of people, it's actually more about the relational experience. Interesting. Yeah. And so uh, we have all these misconceptions. And you're books and your work has been a lot about breaking down these misconceptions. So what are the the things that you often say to people when they come in with these misconceptions? Like it's just about sluthood or it's just about like your attachment disorder or totally any of those type of. Yeah. Words. I mean, the key is to not actually bite the bait and get triggered by it. Oh, that's the first. That's a that's a sweet idea, but how do we really do with it? Right, exactly. <laughs> no, and not no. take it personal and just go, okay, yeah. this is what this person has been kind of fed through the culture or society. This isn't actually yeah. a criticism of me. And just you know, holding one seat to say, well, that's not actually what it's about. Are you curious to hear what it's about for me? Mm, yeah, that's such a good line. Right, you're such a good therapist. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, people coming to me as clients are not coming. With, yeah. They might have some of those internalized that we work with, sure. right? But they're not yeah. meeting with like, actually, I should take that back. Sometimes they have couples where one person wants to do it and the other one is just like, this is bullshit. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and this is you not wanting me or not able to commit to me. And then we do have to deconstruct like, what's the actual meaning of it for the person that wants to do it? That sounds like a really tense experience where one partner wants it and one partner doesn't. It's really hard. Oof. I mean, I I keep thinking of it as like, think of our generation, right? We had yeah. some notion of like, oh, when I'm going to partner up with someone, I know the questions to ask about lifestyle or like, do you want kids or not want kids? You know, do we want to yeah. live here or live there? Like we kind of know the non, like the deal breakers to ask. Yeah. And no one thinks, no one foresaw, oh, we should ask them about monogamy. No. Right. So all these no. relationships never talked about it. And then it shows up and they've just like, I never even thought this was a thing that could break yeah. us up. Mm. I mean, I, I've experienced it in like the queer culture of like, it's actually just implied. Exactly. Like, I mean, we've you and I have talked about this before where it's like, I feel like an outcast because I've said, Almost immediately, I'm interested in monogamy. Right. And uh, and people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what is that anymore? And it's an interesting like aspect of queer culture. It's not, I don't mean to make a globalization, but it's, it's certainly, it's certainly present quite a bit in queer culture that yeah. there's like, I'm an out, I feel like an outcast because I'm interested in monogamy, where it's, it almost feels like an implied principle that it's uh, going to be um, non-monogamous. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I've seen with yeah. a lot of the gay couples that I work with. We're yeah. like, we were doing this for decades before the word polyamory <laughs> existed, you know, like it yeah. was just implied. And yeah. What was negotiated is sort of how and when, or do we tell each other mm-hmm. much or not? You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so even that, like we're getting into like some of the rules, it yeah. sounds like. And what what are, granted, like no couple is going to be the same, but how do you start to establish the rules and even suggest some rules that you've found to be 
effective. Yeah. And so people don't like the word rules these days, just so you know. Oh, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, that's okay. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's more about agreements. Because there's something that's... about like hard rules feels too controlling and limited. Mm. And so it is. Every partnership has different kind of agreements they need to make. And sometimes it's just the basics of, okay, what are our safer sex agreements? When do we communicate? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we approach that with other partners? What do we communicate each other in terms of who and when we've been with people? And other than Mm -hmm. that, do what you kind of want, you know? (laughs) And, And that does not work for many people. There's more agreements around how often we see each other, how to feel like this relationship's getting enough. How often are we away from each other, right? This, And this varies depending on, are you raising kids together? Do you live together or not? Like all of that matters. Transitions is a really important one. Like Mm -hmm. if we're going on dates with others, what do I need and you need before that? And then how do Mm -hmm. we reconnect after? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then just in general, like how much do you want to know about those experiences? How entwined or involved do you want metamors to be, you know, partners of partners? Yeah. So, yeah, that's just like a general, you know, but then people can get more rigid in. And this is where it becomes problematic, like rules on sex acts you can't do with other people. Right. Like no foot massages. That's exactly the one I was thinking. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that's what most people make rules on. <laughs> Very intimate. Right. It is intimate for some. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. But usually not the rule, right? No. Um, or things like you can't have overnights with someone else. You can't travel with someone yeah. else, you know, versus I do recommend if you're new to opening up, okay, let's pace those things. Let's not start mm. with a weekend vacation with an, a new person, right? Like let's get yeah. to know them and have the back and forth of dating and then transition into that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like a couple has to have their shit together before they open it up? It's such a great question. It's sort of like enough of their shit together and Mm. yet. (laughs) So I'll say this in two parts, right? (laughs) Yeah. Like if couples are in high conflict, I cover this in a chapter in Polywise, right? Like if you're really like, a burning ship. <laughs> if you're a dumpster fire right, of a couple. Like, this is not the time <laughs> to open up. If you feel like you're needing to save your relationship, you know, like relationally, you're not treating each other well, you don't have good communication. This is not the way to go yet. Right. Yeah. There needs to be a baseline of health and really respect for each other and like ability to communicate about hard stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. However, I have seen couples that had their shit together and then Mm. the surprises of transitioning, like, Mm. destabilized them a lot. I mean, I mean, in some ways I could say that was Dave and I's story, right? Mm. We were like the, I, not the idea, but like people admired us as a couple with just how, like, we had it. We were good. Our communication was great. Yeah. We dealt with conflict well. We've been through a lot of life transitions together. Yeah. And then yet, here we were dealing with just new things that were surprising. So, hmm. yeah. Do you, are you open to saying a little bit of more? Of course. About I mean, and we talk things. a lot about it in the book, too. I so it's, it's out there. I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there. Yeah. Uh, two of the big things was Dave, was, who had thought himself to be securely attached, realized he had mm-hmm. quite an anxious attachment and sort of monogamy mm. was holding that attachment into secure place. And as we so nuanced, right? Oh my gosh. No, so nuanced. We don't have monogamy yeah. and he's like having panic attacks and yeah. jealous in ways that was just never an issue before. And yeah. it was a lot. Yeah. You know, and then what happened too, is it exposed, even though we felt really solid before it was like, Oh, there's all this subtle. And now it's moved to, not so subtle codependency that we had to deal mm. with. Yeah. Yeah. Where Oof. I would over function and allowed him to under function. And it was like, whoa, this is not sustainable if we have other people in our lives. Oof. So how do you want to tell folks what happened next? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to ruin the surprise. Well, it's like <laughs> years, right? It's years. Know, of, years. Right? We've, we've been together for a long time. 
I mean, Dave went on a big journey. Like he went into therapy. He did psychedelic and medicine journeys and work and just all of that to really work on what was coming up within him. Yeah. And we have different stories of like why we kind of ended our romantic relationship, you know, but through our journey of polyamory and actually getting different needs met by other people, we realized we're amazing humans together. We're not actually good lovers. (laughs) Oh, interesting. Yeah. How do you how do you discern the difference? Yeah, because it felt like the romantic needs that I needed weren't being mm-hmm. met. It wasn't really the way he wanted to show up in his relationships at that time. Mm-hmm. Even I think sexually we had great experiences, but actually have different erotic blueprints at that time, especially. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, and the codependency was really depolarizing for me since I was in more of that over-functioning role yeah you know but we're like we co-parent well together we do life together well and so we transitioned out of being romantic partners yeah and now we still live together we still parent together we wrote a book together you know so there's (laughs) we consider each other life partners right and we still have so much intimacy but no longer have that part of our relationship which Mm. is beautiful you know it's Mm. it's great i'm curious if like was there was there a mourning process for you absolutely yeah we did do like an official split and like moved out for about a year year and a half like ended and released the relationship like for a while only had the transition of parenting you know as our focus and then we were able to come back and like reestablish. Yeah, but, you know, in a 20 plus year connection, that was a year and a half of it, you know, it's kind of a fraction, yeah. right? But it was it was yeah. really necessary. Yeah. And I think for people, they're often afraid to make that because it feels like, oh, well, how can we ever come back together? Who knows what that looks like? And you kind of have to yeah. enter the unknown. Yeah. That sounds scary as shit. How did you support yourself during that sort of unknown? Yeah. Like, will we find each other? I think I had a knowing that we would. I mean, it was nice that we had a kid, right? So there was this way that it was like, I know we're always going to be in connection. Yeah. And I had faith in our friendship. Yeah. Yeah. And our Mm. chart always said... (laughs) (laughs) Our human design chart always was like, you are like family of like, you two are so locked in as family. So I think, you know, as silly as that sounds, there was something that was just like, I don't actually think we're permanently losing each other, but I needed to grieve the marriage Mm -hmm. and go through a full on, like, this is the end of a marriage grieving process and like reestablishing and finding myself. Yeah. Yeah. And we undid our first vows and revowed to each other. So that really helped too. Wow. Yeah. I think that was a big support of releasing the wedding vows and then revowing as parents and humans. Wow. Yeah. I never thought about that, like, like shifting the ritual to, in terms of uh, another form of intimacy or relationship. Yeah. If people do that, I think it's great. Or Mm. if you can, even just release the vows with each other and do an uncoupling process, just that alone I think is so important mm. if, if you can tolerate each other enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the trick total right plasticity, there. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Navigating all the hurts and the like. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oof. I want to take a moment to give a loud shout out to The Embody Lab, which is one of the most incredible resources for body-based and somatic therapies. This show is all about healing, and The Embody Lab does exactly that. Whether you're on your own journey of transformation and discovery, or enhancing your skill sets in your career as like a coach or a therapist, a body worker, or really any career where you are supporting other gently used humans, the Embody Lab is your place for deep, inspiring, and impactful workshops, certificates, masterclasses, and an incredible community of like-minded folks. I love the Embody Lab. 
And so do so many other people that call it a platform to come home to over and over again. The Embody Lab is giving my listeners an exclusive offer, a one-time 10% off code to enhance your embodied well-being. All you have to do is go to theembodylab.com and use the code GENTLYUSE10 at checkout. You said a word that I I have a deep suspicion mm-hmm. that perked a lot of people's ears up, and it was erotic blueprint. Yeah, I guess that's two words. It is two. Words. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm ha- my counting today is 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 questionable. <laughs> Can saying you? This isn't a math podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember physics. Um, I didn't do so well. So what is what is erotic blueprint? And how do I figure that out for myself? Yeah, this is Miss Jaya's work. So people can go mm-hmm. to MissJaya.com and there's a quiz and all of that. And she's also on the show Love, Sex, and Goop that's on Netflix, the Gwyneth Paltrow show. Yeah. So you can see some of examples of the different erotic blueprint styles are like the languages of love different person (laughs) yeah but sort of the five styles for sexuality so it's energetic sensual sexual kinky and then shapeshifter which does all four Mm. yeah maybe in different orders or needs them all at once or you know jessica i don't know if this is too intimate as friends but like what's your erotic blueprint it's okay to share yeah (laughs) I am, I have like a sequencing of it. I oh, need, you do? Okay. Yeah, I need like an energetic, mm-hmm. like an energetic kinky where I need a certain dynamic to feel really mm-hmm. polarized mm-hmm. that gets mm-hmm. me into sexual and then mm-hmm. I'm sensual after that. Mm-hmm. Usually after the orgasm, right? <laughs> you mm-hmm. can shift yeah. into more sensual experience. Yeah. So that's what I do. I really learned like I need to feel this energetic dynamic that could be kinky. It doesn't have to be, but if that doesn't exist, then yeah. But the, like the core is really the sexual in the middle there. Mm. Mm. What about you? (laughs) Well, this is such a good dinner table discussion. I just want to invite everyone at their next family dinner (laughs) to ask, what is your, what is your erotic blueprint? Right. Do you need feathers um, or, you need- <laughs> or hiccups? <laughs> <laughs> Mine is definitely energetic. Mm-hmm. I will take that over anything any day. Mm. And and I, yeah, there's a sequence too for me too, but like it absolutely starts energetic and then it's sensual mm. yeah. and then sexual. And I, kink has like, I've, uh, kink has never been my jam yeah. it's like i sometimes i feel like i'm like compared to all my friends including you as a friend i'm like i'm so boring <laughs> i'm just so like i just want an energetic connection and it will take me to the moon and back and someone brings out a whip or a giant phallus and i'm just like what are you doing right like <laughs> I, why aren't we just sharing an energetic exchange <laughs> I don't um, think you're boring at all. <laughs> thanks. So. I don't think that's boring. <laughs> right. I think that we like sensationalize kink and, and often yeah. think it's these more extreme things. And so it is more mm. entertaining. Right. If you, especially if you're watching it on the screen, yeah. right. Or yeah, yeah, in yeah. front of you, then like people breathing together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's probably like the reworking that if we've watched porn before, we've had intercourse or we've had any type of sex. Yeah. Where we have to go like, wait, why wasn't it that? Exactly. Yeah. And for people listening to you, like most porn is typically that like very intense sexual style. And then you yeah. think that all of sex is just this sexual style and that version of the sexual yeah. style. Yeah. 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 Well, I used to watch... Uh, ultra feminist lesbian porn with my friends in high school. So I didn't quite have that perspective. Do you watch Erica Lust's work? Yes. Yes. 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. I there was this sex shop in Minneapolis that was like this like super ultra feminist. That's what it was called. I'm not just calling it super <laughs> it was feminist. Called super they called ultra it ultra feminist. <laughs> super ultra feminist or something like that. It was like a very it was like a feminist sex shop. Mm-hmm. And they had great talks, like stuff that was like super I just c- clearly want to use the word super. <laughs> it was like queer and unique and and really uh, sensual and energetic conversations around sex that I hadn't been exposed to. And and they had great, like really interesting toys I had never seen. And yeah. And they had they had what do you call them when you go to like a screening? Yeah. They had screenings of like the porn where people could go watch together and then talk about yeah. it. I know. <laughs> How incredible that you were exposed to that in high school. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, the Twin Cities is pretty progressive, yeah. I would say. And I think they just didn't check my ID. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> or I had a fake one right. or something. Right. <laughs> I always had a beard, even when I was a drag queen. So I think I just looked older. You, you passed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I passed. <laughs> so... I want to talk a little bit about something because our very first conversation we ever had years ago, which was essentially our first podcast right, episode, we, we just never we recorded. Should recorded it. <laughs> <laughs> we should have recorded it. But it was like, I was like, oh my gosh, how do you discern the difference between what is a maybe avoidant attachment mm-hmm. style that leads itself into non committed intimacy yeah. and, or, like really a more secure sense of being able to have multiple threads of love simultaneously right? or multiple intimate threads yeah. simultaneously. That's great. And that's right. Coming back to the misconceptions is one of them yeah. that non-monogamy is for avoidant people. And honestly, yeah, people with avoidant attachment style don't do very well in non-monogamy. No. Because it requires so much intimacy. <laughs> it yeah, requires, yeah, I, I mean, it requires difficult conversations that you can't really avoid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think sometimes you will, of course, like, I want to make this very clear. All of the attachment styles are in monogamy and all of them are in non-monogamy. <laughs> yeah. Right? And the research actually shows that in polyamory, people tend to be more secure than not, mm. than monogamy. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Right. So and again, for the same reason, it's like you kind of have to earn your secure attachment quickly to be able to do this well. Yeah. But of course, there can be people who are avoidant that are looking more for hookups. They're not looking for relational intimacy when people are sort of initiating or inviting them into relational intimacy, emotional intimacy. They kind of pull back, right? Or they're in it for a while. The minute there's a bump in the road with some conflicts, they exit, right? So that's sort of the pattern you're going to see, you know, which is different than I have multiple partners. (laughs) So can you give us a little more like example of like Mary? Mm Mm-hmm. It was just Easter, so that's the name of my end. <laughs> this is going to be Mary and Joseph then. <laughs> Mary and Joseph, who are just random people, and this is not a religious question. Right. Like, like Mary and Joseph, like, if we talk through, like, what, if they're opening up to being in a polyamorous relationship, how do we recognize that their behaviors yeah. and whether this this is secure, whether this is anxious, whether this is avoidant stances that are coming in. Right. So who should have the more anxious style and who should have the more avoidant? Joseph, of course. Will be more anxious all the way. Joseph is anxious? <laughs> totally. I don't know. I don't... Right. No, but just to go with it. So <laughs> yeah, let's right. go with If that. Joseph's more anxious in the opening up process, then he is yeah. going to like want to know all the details of what maybe Mary's doing and and probably have a lot of comparison jealousy. Like, am mm-hmm. I enough? Is this other person better than me? You're going to mm-hmm. leave me for them. There's going to be a lot of fear of abandonment that the anxious style yeah. has, right? Yeah. Of, if someone's going to come along and they're going to be better and you're going to leave me. And they're yeah. usually going to have, they or they could have like the primal panic episodes of feeling this disconnection when their partner's on a date they might oh, yeah. really look to their partner to co-regulate or even regulate for them, 
when there's mm-hmm. distress, right? Mm-hmm. And so their skills, they usually need to learn how to self-regulate, <laughs> how mm-hmm. to ask for their needs, but also know they can't get their needs met all the time, mm-hmm. right? And not be like trying to manage their anxiety through rules and restrictions on their partner. Mm-hmm. So that's what can come up too. It's like, oh, I feel like, if you can only see people this much or if there's this limits or can't massage feet, you know, <laughs> then, <laughs> then I'll feel secure. Right. What? Right. Massaging feet is so important. I know. <laughs> so whereas let's say Mary is more avoidant, what's going to happen mm. is Mary might not want to have a lot of conversations that need to be had or do, mm. but then remember them very differently. Yeah. And so there's things that like the more avoidance style kind of forgets to tell their partner. And it's not, it's amazing. It's not intentional. They would just forget to say, Oh, I planned the date or I forgot to tell you that we did have sex <laughs> or like, <laughs> like they'll tend to paint a picture for their partner that doesn't really match what's happening. Mm. And it's I, it's so interesting to me because I can see, oh, you're not intentionally painting. They'll leave out details. They'll, they'll downplay, yeah. right? Yeah. And warning to everyone, do not predict. I say don't crystal ball. Like the avoidant will be like, oh, I don't even know if I'm interested in them. And then they go and have sex with that person and they're super interested in them. And their partner's yeah. like, what? Like they're so shocked, right? Yeah. Instead of just saying, Clearly, I'm interested. I'm going on the date and we'll see what happens, right? Mm. Yeah. I'm interested Mm. enough to meet them again. Yeah. So the avoidant, that's a lot of what I see show up typically, you know, or they'll forget agreements. But the two styles will often interpret agreements also drastically different. Like the same word means something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Like Like what? Coming home soon. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah or what sex is <laughs> yes yes yeah, yeah i mean just these things that we take for granted you know yeah. of, i'll check in with you later <laughs> what does later mean <laughs> yeah if you're listening to this and you're like oh i see myself right. um just That's know right. you're loved right. you're loved right. we're human we're gently used humans just figuring it out totally yeah. Oh, and it's, I mean, these are interesting things. You know, like how often do we each go into a relationship or relationships in a plural sense and be like, what's your definition of sex? Right. What's, what's your definition of coming home later? Right. Exactly. Or, you know, right. or it's, what's it's your, a lot to sort out. Right. What's a yeah. quick call to your other partner mean? Right. To me, that means mm. 10, 15 minutes, you're on for an hour and 20, you know? Right. We don't yes. think of that. I mean, I oh, I was going to say 30 seconds is a lot. Is a quick, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, now you know why I like monogamy. Right. Exactly. <laughs> if it hasn't been clear yet. Yeah. I mean, I think queer culture has been much better at being like, well, sex isn't just obviously, you know, penis and hole right yeah that sex is defined much more broadly yeah oil wrestling counts <laughs> right exactly <laughs> yeah. uh, food fights count right my book it's all it's all crossing a line right. here <laughs> I, I imagine despite even in the most secure sense of and why don't we actually define like what does Mary and Joseph look like in a secure sense? Yeah. So if they're secure and they're new to opening up, they're still going to have difficult feelings. They're still going to have jealousy. They're going to still have uncertainty, right? They still might feel insecure in moments, but the Mm. difference is, is they're able to better regulate themselves. Mm -hmm. They're better able to not sort of lash out and react to their, onto their partner and be like, Hey, I'm struggling. Let's talk. And they can co-regulate yeah. together. Mm. Yeah. They're will, much more likely to have sort of a growth mindset mm. of like, this is a whole new experiment and we're learning a lot and we're going to try to do as less damage along the way. But of course, there's going to be lots of things you just can't foresee. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And there's going to be a, like the willingness to consider each other, right? That goes, because mm. sometimes in these more insecure styles, there can become this real battle between one partner's freedom mm-hmm. and the other partner's safety. Yes. Right. And they seem like needs and odds. You know, yeah. And sometimes they are. Right. Yeah. But often yeah. when we dig down, what someone calls their need for freedom isn't so much about freedom. Like it's about doing mm-hmm. whatever you want, whenever you want and like acting like a single person, which I'm like, I'm not sure yeah. that's actually freedom. Right? No. <laughs> but, you know, and similar, like the person who might be saying, I need to feel safe. Of course, safety is important, but they might actually be saying, don't ever make me feel uncomfortable. Mm. Can't promise that. Right? Yeah. 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 Right. Or always choose me first. Right? Yeah. Well, and here's like a common, I would imagine a common, I've heard it enough. So I'm going to say it's a common question. Yeah. It's like, can, if Mary and Joseph, still funny, yeah. open up their relationship, do, will they be together for as long as they would have if they didn't? It's a great question. And I would say we don't know. Right? So for some couples, they open up and it really strengthens the relationship and it allows yeah. them to deepen their commitment because they don't feel like I can never get any of my needs met elsewhere. Right. Because mm. there's this funny setup in monogamy that, yeah. you know, we contract as if we're going to meet each other's every needs, even though that's not possible. Right. So, of course, monogamous or exclusive relationships can make room for that or at least acknowledge it. But, yeah, for many people, the kind of stress of the opening up process expedites what would have happened anyway. It just exposes Mm. a lot of it sooner. Mm. Yeah. So I see that where it's like, oh, this was going to end, but it would have maybe taken three or four or five more years or another decade. Right. Whereas Mm. this showed the things that weren't working. Also, for some people, they just, they really change. Mm. It can be quite an awakening for people. And they Mm -hmm. realize in that process, all these non-negotiables, they either didn't realize before or just didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So then Mm -hmm. they say, I love you, but we're not compatible. Mm. Yeah. So I think what's nice with the paradigm of non-monogamy is it's not, defining the success of a relationship based on longevity. Mm. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, what? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Wait, what? My... Say that again. Yes. So, right, monogamous <laughs> relationships. And we do this. Oh, you've been together so long, right? What's your secret? Yeah. That's so amazing. And it is amazing if they're happy. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like, then I do want to know, oh, you're still having sex after 20 years? I want to hear about that, you know? But many people are together for a long time. They're not happy. It's not necessarily healthy. It's not a relationship maybe I would want, you know? Mm. I think mm. non-monogamy is better at embracing that a relationship can be quite successful. And part of that success might be, thank you for our time together. <laughs> And now it's time to part, right? Instead Mm. of try to force ourselves to stay together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think this, and I've asked this to my friends and you, like who are, who work on not just like monogamous couples therapy, but like polyamorous couples therapy, which is, God bless you. (laughs) Just just, like, it's it's hard enough to do monogamous couples therapy. Yeah. I think I referred someone to you once because like I got on the phone with them and I was like, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed. Mm. I don't even know where to begin. Yeah. Here's my friend, Jessica. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you for that. Yes, thank you. (laughs) But like, you know, like, as you say, like jealousy is so innate in this process and dealing with jealousy in a monogamous context is, is I think challenging. But when you deal with it where there's like, because there's a diversity of attention. Like there's, we only have so much attention energy yeah. to go around. And when you start to shift it and spread it, like jealousy is an absolutely normal emotion to come up. And, and so how do you deal with this? In, yeah, as a, right. There's studies that show that babies as young as six months old 
will mm-hmm. ex- like show display jealousy when their caretaker mm-hmm. is giving attention to someone else. Wow. And I love that because it really, I want yeah. to normalize like when the people we value mm-hmm. are not giving us the attention we want, we will have feelings about it. Right. Cause it's especially mm. as a baby, it's like, Whoa, that's my main resource here. And like, yeah. that's my lifeline is you paying attention to me. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we, that, it, that same circuitry, I think goes off of like, if you're not paying attention to me, I might die. Even though as an adult, mm. it's not, actually what's happening no, right but it no. can feel like my life is on the line here yeah yeah so for one it's normalizing jealousy there's nothing wrong with it mm. and let's explore it as a messenger is the way i do it mm. what is it telling us so sometimes it's more personal it's about me it's not my partner's doing everything good but i'm comparing yeah. myself to their partner i have insecurities mm. about my value or worse or I have insecure attachment history I need to work on, you know? <laughs> a lot, that's one aspect. A lot of times it's relational, right? It's that, mm. whoa, you know, we've created a relationship where I have your attention four nights a week and now you just cut that in half. This isn't jealousy. Yeah. This is like my attachment needs are not being met, <laughs> you know? And my yeah. system is like, you know, processing. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. That's a lot. I, I mean, I, I think about that in terms of one of the things more than like, oh, someone's going to have sex with someone else. I'm like, I I know for myself and I'm curious for you. It's like, I really only have so much attention. Yeah. Like, I find it difficult enough to do, to spread that attention between work and family and a partner. And the idea of stepping into more partnerhood radically makes me like clamp up about like where is that energy going to come from yes i agree i absolutely agree it's similar for me i only have so much like i couldn't have a bunch of partners how do you is it mean that polyamory relationships require more self-care i think they do and i think this becomes a surprise Mm. for people because you can get away in monogamy for a while with not a lot of self-care yeah. And then people yeah. wake up to their need for self-care when they're like, okay, I'm managing this partner and this partner. And when do I get time for myself yeah. just to integrate yeah. the experiences, yeah. let alone yeah. like be with myself? Yeah. So people realize it's a need they haven't been claiming or carving out time for. And then yeah. it's, yeah. So I think that's the yeah. hardest piece of non-monogamy or one of the harder pieces is our hearts are infinite in love, mm. but our time is limited. You know, especially if we're talking about polyamory, I do think there's a limit of how many sort of involved relationships people can have. Yeah. But you have to decide your own limit, right? This show is also brought to you by the absolutely stunning and powerful tools of transformation that are created by Omala. Oof, even the name Omala transports you to a place of flow and vitality. These are some of my favorite products ever. They have an amazing color-changing yoga mat that responds to your temperature and presence and reflects back your posture in real time. There's this incredible smelling skin balm candle that heats up to activate all the essential oils and vitamins that your skin has been craving. I mean, look, if I could live in a giant bath of this candle, I would 100% do it. They also have these journals that lead you into profound insight, and then you get to plant those journals to create a stunning flower garden. What? I mean, if that's not deep and inventive, I don't know what is. If you're someone who desires to live a luxurious flow of life and who believes in transformative wellness, then you have to check out Omala. Omala is giving my listeners an exclusive discount to treat yourself to something that is as special as you, boo. All you have to do is go to omala.com, that's O-M-A-L-A.com, and use the code DRSCOTT10 at checkout. And a portion of every purchase goes to an incredible charity. You got this. I had a patient come in years ago 
for chronic strep throat. And it was, you know, had been on so many series of antibiotics mm -hmm. and couldn't figure out why they kept getting sick. And so we, we expanded it to look at lifestyle and, mm -hmm. you know, and this individual had seven partners, seven po like polyamorous seven partners, partners, seven, wow. yeah. let alone the other activities they did. And it, it took some time to get to this, this place where they felt like if they, they were enough, if they weren't spreading their love, yeah, like they, the self was enough. Mm. And at that point they were able to break off some of the relationships and start to modulate how much energy they actually, they didn't have a single day off to themselves in the entire year. I, we went through their calendar. Right. And I was like, so we started, we titrated it. We took one day off a month to begin with. And then one day off a week. And then, you know, just like really, and like what happens in the time off? There was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of sense of what I, what, what am I doing if I'm not checking in with all my partners? Yeah. It was, and what they got to by the end was really a balanced sense of division of energy and attention and love. Mm. And they didn't have any of the strep throat uh, incidents or the sickness come back. That it was really right. The 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 sickness was a sign of a lack of reserve. Right. Of overextending. Overextending. Yeah. I love this story. And the, mm. to me, it's also can be a good example of how sometimes anxious attachment can do non-monogamy is it's like, mm. if I never have to be alone because I have enough partners. Yeah. Right. So sometimes there can be this collecting of like too many people you don't actually have time for so that you don't have to face yeah. yourself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's real. Yeah. I mean, we, we, and it does, we can do that in monogamy too. Totally. Making yourself busy with whatever. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I really found out, and I don't like the word toxic, but I'm going to use it for being dramatic, is like finding myself in quote unquote toxic relationships as a means to avoid myself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's so distra delightfully distracting. Yeah. I mean, some of, and I see this in sort of more yeah. of the female with avoidant attachment, we go into caretaker mm -hmm. mode. So we're very involved, very much mm. meeting the emotional needs of other people as a way to like, oh, I get to avoid myself. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> yeah. We're so tricky. We are. We're so tricky. We're complex. We're complex. We're nuanced. And I, and I really appreciate you helping folks build a map because I, I, maybe it's a misconception or maybe we've established it, but like, when you start to add multiple partners, whether it's just sexual or love partners, the nuance of human interaction gets that much more complex. I completely agree. I mean, okay. I say absolutely. <laughs> and I say that's the beauty and the challenge of this. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. with any system, we can look at biological systems, right? Like mm -hmm. the organ is much more complex than the cell. Right? Mm -hmm. so the organ can do yeah. all these things that the cell can't do, right? But the organ can also have a lot more complications <laughs> that the cell won't mm. have, right? So you can see like, yes, if we complexify and have more people in our life, we can have more love, we have more intimacy, we have more support. I mean, yeah. people are doing incredible things with finances, like pooled finances and, you know, shared yeah. living and co-raising multiple children. It's like incredible, and yes, there can be more drama <laughs> like because we're <laughs> complex and there's more ways we're going to get triggered and activated by each other. Yeah. Yeah. First, thank you for speaking my love language, which is physiology. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you know me. Yeah. Thank you for seeing me. You're like, oh, I got it. Right. <laughs> so let's say Mary and Joseph were to have a kid yeah. named, I don't know, Jeff. <laughs> Jealous. Jealous. I mean, aren't they kind of open already? Like, where did this immaculate conception come from, God? Mm -hmm, <laughs> there was a third mm -hmm. in this relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, they have I can't I can't wait for the the comments on that one. Right. Yeah, like what do you like how, because that's a whole nother dynamic is to like when opening up a relationship yeah. is like w how do you explain it to the kiddo yeah or do you not oh yeah this depends i mean okay 
So in my case, where my son was kind of born into this, yeah, and Dave's other partner right now, her children were also kind of born into this. Yeah. We just start explaining from day one, you know, mm. love, it comes in many forms. I mean, and, and I've been explaining to my son, you might fall, you know, you can date men, women, everyone in between, you know, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. even that's been a part of the narrative. We can love multiple, our heart is big, all of that stuff. But I am protective of our partners creating attachment bonds with him until there's really mm. like, a vetting and attachment that we have with them and a certain level of mm-hmm. commitment yeah. versus those yeah. people just being like any of my friends that know my son, you know, so yeah. certain partners, it's like, yep, yeah, you can know him and we can hang out, but we're not creating attachment bonds. Mm. There's a threshold for me that has to get passed. Yeah. Yes. Um, but That's- you know, many people come out to their kids because they start doing this after their kids are already born. Yeah. And these days, some kids are like, whatever, mom or dad, or, you know, they're just like, yeah. that's how it is. <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 Like their kids have already even come out to them as pan or not straight or queer, whatever it yeah. is, non-binary. So it's, yeah. it's like getting easier. And then yeah. some adult, I've seen some adult, Kids are just like, I don't want anything to do with that. Keep it to yourself. Yeah. But I'm seeing less and less of that. And I've, I really appreciate you breaking that down yeah. because I, I think it's one of the things that, you know, definitely comes up as part of the nuanced yeah. complexity. And people are really like, uh, I'd say, uh, yeah, I'd say sure. more than half the time. Like I'll do sessions with clients and they're like, okay, we're planning. We're going to go through everything. Like there's all of this prep to come out to their kids. They, they're doing, they have the dinner and they tell them and then their kids are like, okay. (laughs) More than half the time they don't care. It's really interesting, you know? Wow. And they'll even be like, so what's this mean for us? You know, or just like, okay. We get more presents at Christmas. Like what's the jam? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I thought one of the ways we can kind of land mm-hmm. our session today is to do a little role playing. <laughs> not not <laughs> I know. You said I would totally role play with you <laughs> and we're going to do it. Right. That's so funny. I always think of role play from the actor's perspective first yeah. and then the sexual like kink last. But we can mix it. I'm into that. Um <laughs> Which is, I let's role play what it would be for, because this is a common, I think, experience right now, is one partner comes out to another partner yes. as wanting to be poly. And, and kind of like the conversation that could go well. Yes. And so I, I'll have you come out to me. Okay. <laughs> so I think you-, you will have better language as to how to navigate my anxious attachment style. Oh, okay. Which I'm making up. I don't really have one. Right. <laughs> Okay. Does that sound fun to you? I think so. Let's try it. Right? Okay. I don't know Let's if I'm good it. at role play, right? <laughs> we'll find out. Why not? Okay. <laughs> so, Scott, there's something I want to share with you that I feel oh, pretty God. nervous. It's, I, I feel nervous. Are you able? You to, feel nervous. Yeah, I feel nervous. It feels important. Are you in a place okay. where you can hear it? First of all, if you're all listening, that is the golden fucking question. Are you ready? Are you? Are you? Can, do you have space for me? Right. Do you have? Yeah. I'm like, that's the first consent. Can we talk about Ugh. something? Right. If we just did that in relationships, so much would go differently. Yeah. Are you? It melts my heart. Yes. So Scott, the- I wouldn't say it this way, but are you resourced <laughs> enough to have a difficult conversation? <laughs> oh my god, that's not that that, that one less melts my heart. Right. Yeah, I thank you for just even asking me. That makes me feel more like whatever we're going to talk about that you're considering me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And so I want you to know, because we've been together for a long time, I'm not actually asking to do anything different yet. Okay. I'm not asking that we change anything yet. I just want to share what yeah. I'm experiencing. Okay. I'm going to take a few deep breaths yeah. and then... Yeah. Okay. So I'm I've been reading this book. Here. Yeah. Is it? Wh- who's the author? Right. It's Sex at Dawn, actually. <laughs> oh, damn. This is where you get to plug your book. 
was reading this book, this uh, attachment that my therapist gave uh-huh. me. <laughs> I was reading this book about sex at dawn, yeah. and it just it awakened something in me that I realized um, mm. that I do believe that we as humans can love more than one person. Wow. I it sounds like that that's a big like significant experience for you to feel that sense of awakening. I, I'm noticing some tightness in my own chest, but I, I wanna keep being here for you mm. and, and hear more about what that means for you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I realize I've always felt this capacity that like, I mean, you've seen even like the way my yeah. friendships just feel way more in depth. They're intimate and it's a different mm. kind of love. Right. And you have that too, yeah. where it's just like, they're not friends, yeah. but they're family. We call them like that. Yeah. Right. Like, and so I realized, oh, in some ways I've already been doing this where yeah. there's multiple loves in my life, mm. but it does. So it's when I'm reading about polyamory, it's, yeah. it's resonating with who I, I think I actually am. Wow. I, I recognize that there's a bravery here Mm -hmm. for you to share all this with me. And I, and I really, wow. I know it's so vulnerable because you have no idea how I'm going to respond and you're sharing something that's you're discovering is really true for you. Yeah. I I don't, I don't want you to think this is about me not loving you or not Mm, being attracted to you. Like that is not what this is about. Like I still feel just as in love with you and attracted to Mm. you, but I also feel like, wow, there's this transformative Mm. potential of exploring intimacy with others too. Yeah. Thank you for really like just seeing what I needed in that moment, Mm. which is like the, the affirmation of, that I'm loved and I'm attracted to you and, and it, it settles me enough to keep being with you and, and hear that like, this is something that, well, we're not changing anything yet is, is really on your mind and in, in your heart to, to, to like, and it sounds like we're having a discussion as opposed to you telling me that we're doing something. Absolutely. I, I don't want to just unilaterally make that kind of change. I want to feel like if Mm. we're going to open up that we would do it together and we would figure out Mm. how that would feel good to us first before just doing it. Yeah. Is it okay if I keep listening to what feels right for you and I maybe take some time not with you, but later about like how this resonates for me and, and what my fears are and, and how I might want to come back absolutely yeah okay that that's really helpful thank you for just to set it up where i I can have some space to hear you and then space to be in my own process without no because i don't know yet yeah well i think what i would love if you'd be willing to like could we read this book together like listen to something Mm. together and just talk about it first yeah as something yeah. we're just exploring as an idea and then and then see does that apply to us what would it look like if it did you know i'm yeah. just learning but it seems like there's so many ways yeah. to do it so it's kind of like our own personal book club of discovery yeah <laughs> just i like that i feel like physiology books <laughs> physiology i i that that soothes me i mean like that that settles me just to be like okay we're we're in a book club together discovering something about human nature and and where it resonates for us and and i appreciate that we can do this together in a way of like discovery as opposed to just change yes and that that makes me feel safe and seen yeah mm, thank you mm, thank you <sighs> That's so sweet. And scene. You're so sweet. <laughs> and scene. Feel free to write that down as a script, everyone, and practice it. <laughs> How did we do? I think we did amazing. You did amazing. You did amazing. Oh, thank you. But you did amazing at monitoring yourself mm. and being willing to hold space for me. Because often that's what happens. A person gets so activated, they can't. Yeah. hold space for their partner's vulnerability of revealing it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we're, 
you know, it's funny, even in these role play situations, like the visceral no, experience I can feel is it. very I was like, real. My warm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. Am I still loved by Jessica? And like, but and like you, and I really appreciated your intuitiveness of, and of, of seeing like me in here. Yeah. And I think that's so important. It's like, yeah, I think like if people take away, there's like, well, the consent, do you have time to talk? Yeah. Are you resourced? Yeah. Right. But then yeah. in this specific conversation of saying, I'm not changing us yet. Yeah. Some people are like, yeah. what? You're going to be fucking someone tomorrow? You know, like it's just <laughs> such a shock, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or it's a violation. It's a unilateral break of your agreements. You know? Yeah. So, and then yeah. to reassure your partner, like this actually isn't about a deficiency in us, mm. right? You're still sexy to me, whatever they mm. need to hear. Yeah. I'm still going to give you that foot massage, bro. Right, bro. right. <laughs> no one else, though. <laughs> no one else gets the foot massage. Amazing. I love this. And thank you so much for coming on and and unpacking all this in mm-hmm. such a gentle, compassionate, humanistic way that I think is – and and really cultivated with science. Yeah. And, and I think that's – You know, I really appreciate your work in that way that I think in an age where science and psychology have really been lifted as something very valuable and important, that you're meeting that with something that's probably been, is, and has been very primal Yeah, as part of our human nature. Totally. Yeah. And where where can people find more of you, my love? Yeah, they can find me, jessicafern.com. That's about it. (laughs) <laughs> are you on socials i can't even remember i am like occasionally on instagram <laughs> like for like this thematic program for the yeah. you know body lab problems i'm like oh I'll post yeah. that right <laughs> <laughs> amazing so people can find you on their website uh your books are everywhere poly secure and poly wise mm-hmm. get them and i will say this to everyone who is listening i have recommended polysecure especially and and polywise but polysecure to everyone i stopped telling people to read any other attachment book Mm -hmm. and it's like even for folks who are in not in relationships who are single i have them read it because i think you tackled the subject of, of attachment in such a beautiful somatic body informed humanistic approach that is so rare as opposed to like a fear mongering approach totally Thank you. I mean, that was my intention was to really have this non-pathologizing approach to attachment in general while connecting it to a specific population. Yeah. I love it. Good. You did it. And it's it's so brilliant. And you deserve all the success of being the queen (laughs) of of consensual polyamory and and everything that comes with the big umbrella. (laughs) Thank you, my love, Thank for being you. on the Gently Used yeah. Human. And for all you Gently Used Humans out there, go check out Jessica Fern's work. She's she's brilliant. Mm-hmm. She's just brilliant. Means a lot for me, Scott. <laughs> oh, thank you, yeah. my love. Thank you for listening to the Gently Used Human podcast with Dr. Scott Lyons and friends. Visit GentlyUse.com for fun extras, including submitting your questions for advice from a Midwestern mom. And don't forget to spill the tea and gossip about the show with all your friends and frenemies. And you know what? Show us some love by giving us five stars and leaving a review in your favorite apps. This helps us connect with all the other gently used humans out there. Oh, and by the way, you look fierce today. Thank you.